In the last video, we learned about the assumptions that underpin the ideal gas model. And I want to deepen our understanding of the ideal gas in this video by thinking about and explicitly writing out the distribution of speeds and energies for particles within an ideal gas. So we've seen already that based on the assumptions of the KMT, ideal gases consist essentially of point-like particles zipping around in straight lines at constant velocity, according to Newton's laws of motion, until they collide with one another or with a wall. However, this does not mean that particles in general have all the same speed. In fact, it's highly unlikely that particles have all the same speed. We've seen, and you can imagine, that a collision between two particles at kind of a glancing angle can lead to a change in the velocity of these particles. And so we should expect not a uniform speed for all, all particles, but a distribution of particle speeds. What exactly do we mean by distribution? Well, what we're looking for essentially here is something like a histogram, really. On the y-axis, we'll put the fraction of particles with a particular speed s, and on the x-axis, we will put speed s. The fraction of particles is equal to the number of particles with a particular speed, little n, s, divided by the total number of particles, capital N or big N. So we're looking for the form of this histogram. What does it look like? To begin to get at this distribution, we can lay out some of the assumptions of the KMT in a slightly different form to think about conditions on the distribution. And this was done by Maxwell back in the 19th century. He reasoned that, all right, since collisions dissipate no energy, the total kinetic energy is conserved. So that means there's one distribution with one total kinetic energy that characterizes the ideal gas. We might see small fluctuations here or there, but the total kinetic energy must be constant. He also reasoned that for a particular speed, the fraction of particles with velocity in any particular direction is constant. So what does that mean? Well, that means if we imagine a particle with a velocity in some direction, let's call it v1, and we imagine another particle with velocity in a different direction, let's say v2, such that the magnitudes of the two velocities are the same, or in other words, the two speeds are the same. The number of particles with velocity v1 should be equal to the number of particles with velocity v2, because their speeds are the same. That means that the fraction of particles depends only on the speed, only on the magnitude of the velocity, and not its direction. That means that no direction is particularly special. And for a gas uniformly distributed in a container with molecules bouncing around randomly, this should make pretty good sense, right? That no direction is particularly special. What that means is that the distribution of speeds must be spatially isotropic. It must look the same no matter how we look at the distribution, no matter what angle or what direction we look at. And furthermore, if we're going to say that no direction is particularly special, that means that the distributions of the velocity components in x, y, and z should also be isotropic. So if we broke down each of these velocity vectors into, say, a y component and an x component, then those two should also be distributed isotropically. So that means we've got an isotropic distribution of the overall velocities, like v1 and v2, and an isotropic distribution of the y velocities, like vy1 and vy2, for example, and the x velocities, vx1 and vx2, and even for that matter, the z velocities, which we of course can't show here, um, should also be isotropic. There's only one type of distribution that has all of these properties, in fact. There's only one type of distribution such that we can take independent distributions in x, y, and z, combine them into a three-dimensional distribution that is also isotropic. And rather than lay it out for you myself, I'm going to turn over the reins to Werner Krauth, who's a professor of statistical mechanics. He teaches this great statistical mechanics class where this distribution is derived statistically from very fundamental and very simple and very beautiful principles. So here he is describing the key distribution for the velocity components of particles within an ideal gas. Gaussians are unique in that independent distributions in x and y give an isotropic distribution in two dimensions. This property 
is general for Gaussians in any dimension. The three-dimensional case is shown here in Gauss3d.py. Each point is a vector x, y, and z, and all three are independent Gaussians. So output of the movie version is shown here, one point, two point, three point, and so on, many points. You see that the distribution is isotropic. And in the movie version, we can even turn around the distribution and look at it from all angles. So there we have it. The key distribution is a Gaussian distribution. And I've drawn a picture of a hypothetical Gaussian here for us. It looks sort of like a bell curve, and really it, it is the bell curve that you may have heard about before. The mean speed is right at the center, and it decays sort of symmetrically on either side of the mean. This is the Gaussian distribution for a single velocity component. So this would be, for example, the speed in the x direction, or the velocity in the x direction. So let's think about this in a little more detail and see how these independent Gaussians in x, y, and z lead to an isotropic three-dimensional distribution. So consider an ideal gas with a mean speed of 10 times the square root of 3, which looks a little bit weird, but notice that if the overall speed is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, then we can see that each of the individual velocity components has a mean speed of 10. 10 times the square root of 3 is equal to the square root of 10 squared plus 10 squared plus 10 squared. So each directional velocity distribution in this hypothetical gas is a Gaussian with some width s, and we'll talk about the width in a second, and a mean centered on 10. When we take each of these Gaussian distributions and combine them to generate the overall distribution of speeds, we find that the speeds fit the Maxwell distribution. So we won't dive into the mathematical details of how you combine the individual velocity component distributions to get the Maxwell distribution. But the most important thing to recognize here is that the fraction of particles with a particular speed is proportional to the speed squared times e to the negative speed squared. And the general shape is shown for you here in blue. It starts out low, which makes sense, the particles are all moving to some degree, goes up to a peak, here it's right around eight or so, and then decays as we go farther out. So there are fewer molecules with very high velocity and few molecules with very low velocity. We're not gonna fully derive the Maxwell distribution, but I do wanna show you that it actually shows up when we simulate an ideal gas. So I wanna turn our attention now to simulating an ideal gas using the simulation shown here. All right, so here we have a container with a movable wall, and I'm just gonna pump some gas in here. The little blue particles are the gas particles, and now they are starting to collide with each other and expand to fill the volume of the container. So it's gonna take a bit of time for this system to reach equilibrium. But when it does, take a look at the distribution of speeds. It's looking quite a bit like the Maxwell distribution. Not too many particles with low velocity moving up to a maximum and then decaying as we move further out to higher speeds. As I increase the temperature of the system, watch the mean of the distribution move out to the right. We get fewer molecules with very low speeds and now we get the very nice Maxwell type of shape with very, very few molecules with low speed, very low speed, going up to a plateau and then decaying down from there. So the distribution is fluctuating over time, but you can see that on the average, and if we were to take the average of all of these instantaneous distributions that we're seeing, we would indeed arrive at the Maxwell distribution. So the proof is in the pudding in terms of this simulation. This is empirical justification for the Maxwell distribution. Now that we've seen the distribution of speeds, we can actually derive the distribution of energies for the particles in an ideal gas. It's called the Boltzmann distribution, and the general shape of a Boltzmann-type distribution of energy is shown for you here. So it looks rather similar to the Maxwell distribution of speeds, but again, notice the general shape here. The fraction of particles with a particular energy is proportional to the square root of the energy times the exponential of negative energy divided by Kb, which is Boltzmann's constant, times the temperature. 
And this is actually a common pattern. You'll notice the exponential of negative energy divided by KBT or divided by RT comes up again and again and again in chemistry. And this is really the reason why the assumption that substances we work with obey the Boltzmann distribution and behave somewhat ideally. Notice what happens as we move to higher temperatures here. So we're starting at 50K with a lot of molecules with very low energy. And we move to 100K and 150 and 200, and the mean of the distribution starts getting pushed out and out and out. The distribution gets flatter and flatter and flatter, and we get more and more molecules with larger energies as the temperature increases. I won't show it for you here, but we can also empirically support the Boltzmann distribution using the same simulation that we used to justify the Maxwell distribution. 